Hi, I'm Mark Hammer from Brigham and Women's Hospital, and I wanted to talk about uh, my approach to the solitary pulmonary nodule. So we're going to talk about first, what is a pulmonary nodule? Um, some different types of nodules that one might see, um, some characteristic benign nodules, and then we'll go through a couple different um, things about oval nodules and a brief mention about cystic nodules, and then move on to um, sort of describing an approach to how to do risk assessment for pulmonary nodules. So what is a pulmonary nodule? Well, a nodule is a, a defined by the Fleischner criteria, a Fleischner society, um, as a round or regular opacity, well or poorly defined up to three centimeters. So it's not a very specific definition. Um, but generally, we're thinking about sort of a generally oval-shaped, round-shaped um, lesion that's isolated in the lung. It may have well or ill-defined margins, but it's sort of a discrete uh, entity. Um, we might hear the term solitary pulmonary nodule, which really just means that it doesn't necessarily mean that there's only one nodule in the patient, but it means that that nodule is isolated from other disease in the lung. It's not a diffuse lung disease. Incidental nodule um, is a term that we would use when uh, we find a nodule but we've done the scan for some other purpose like chest pain, uh, trauma, dyspnea, something like that. And we see a pulmonary nodule, that nodule is incidental. And that's to distinguish it from the case where we find a nodule when we're looking for one, when a patient has a known cancer or something. And of course, the scenario um, has direct bearing upon um, what uh, the, the risk of that nodule being. So what isn't a nodule? Like I was alluding to, um, when we have sort of a confluent or constellation of findings, uh, that I would not describe as a nodule. So we have this thing on the left here, which is a large area of consolidation or airspace disease. It's also actually turned out to be a malignant uh, lymphoma, um, but is not a nodule. And in here we have a micronodular pattern of clustered or tree and bud nodules here in a patient um, with MAI. Again, not really the kind of nodule we're talking about. So let's go through a couple of different sort of types uh, of nodules. So of course, there's the calcified nodule here, pretty straightforward. Um, we have the solid nodule. So the density of the nodule is equal to that of blood vessels in the lung. We have a ground glass nodule. So the density of this nodule, which is again, a, a well-defined um, lesion in the lung, uh, the density is less than that of the adjacent blood vessels. And of course, we have the part solid nodule, which has both ground glass and solid components. And we'll kind of just, we'll come back to these nodules uh, later in the talk. So for calcified nodules, there are several different benign patterns of calcification. Of course, if the nodule is entirely calcified, um, it should be benign. Um, you can also have central calcification, like in this case, where the calcification is directly in the center of the nodule. And then I don't have an example here, but the so-called lamellated pattern, where you have concentric rings of calcification, that's also a benign pattern. Um, I should say that this doesn't always apply if you have um, a patient with a known malignancy that produces calcifying nodules. Those nodules can then be completely calcified and be metastatic, but um, absent that history, um, you can uh, use these rules. Um, now, hamartomas um, can be characteristically benign. Um, so um, if you see characteristic popcorn-like calcification in a nodule, like in this case, or macroscopic fat in a nodule, like in this case here, um, then you can be pretty confident the nodule is hamartoma and does not require any further workup. As I'll show you a little bit later, most hamartomas do not have these characteristic findings, um, but if you do see them, then you can be pretty confident about the diagnosis and they do not require further follow-up. One other comment to make, um, you should not be measuring the attenuation of a nodule to see if it has fat in it. Um, you really just have to be able to see by, with your eyes macroscopic fat. If you do not see that, then do not measure the nodule. Um, you can easily be mistaken by necrosis or, or other um, fluid containing um, things that can be kind of low in attenuation, um, but are not truly fat. Um, the other important class and very common class of benign nodules are the intrapulmonary lymph nodes. These are probably the most common type of nodule, solid nodule that we see. 
Um, and these have um, often have a characteristic appearance. They're either oval or polygonal or triangular in shape. Um, you can see the triangular shape here pretty nicely on the sagittal reformatted image. They are often either uh, adjacent to a pleural surface like here along the fissure, who are often located um, in close proximity to a pleural surface like in this case, here we can have, the, we see this nodule on the left lower lobe that's uh, let's say five millimeters or so from the pleura. You can see it has a polygonal shape here um, and we see a very small septal connection to a blood vessel. Um, so as you probably know, the lymphatics um, travel not only in the pleural surfaces, but also travel along the bronchovascular bundles. And so you may see interpulmonary lymph nodes along vessels. Um, the nodes that are along the fissures um, can be confidently diagnosed as being benign and do not really require any further workup. The other nodules that look like benign interpulmonary lymph nodes, such as this one, uh, would require follow-up, but um, we can suggest that it is probably an interpulmonary lymph node based on its appearance. Now, moving on to another important category of nodules, that is the oval nodule. Um, the oval well-circumscribed smooth nodule is a pretty common entity. Some of these do represent interpulmonary lymph nodes, of course, um, but there are other, sort of putting that category aside, there are several other entities that can give you oval nodules um, that you should be aware of. The first is the hamartoma. So here is an example of a hamartoma that did not have calcification or fat uh, mac macroscopically uh, by imaging. And this was proven by surgical resection. So most hamartomas will be of this category um, where they're you know, indeterminate based on CT and would require uh, biopsy or surgical resection to prove that they're benign. Um, these generally do not have any uptake on PET, so that could be helpful. Um, but usually um, these do usually go to some kind of pathologic confirmation. Um, the carcinoid tumor is another uh, lesion that causes, that generally presents as an oval nodule. So some carcinoids will present as endobronchial lesions. Um, setting those aside for this talk, uh, we're focusing on the peripheral carcinoid tumors, um, which present as oval nodules somewhere in the lung parenchyma. You may see them in association with bronchi, but often you will not. You may see some distal air trapping, but again, often you will not. Um, and uh, these are oval and generally very slow growing nodules. You may see that they may appear stable over a year or two, but if you happen to have more um, time, you'll see that they are very slowly growing. Um, you may wonder about using nuclear medicine scans to evaluate these, for example, a dotatate PET. Um, and pulmonary carcinoids have variable uptake on those scans, um, so that's not always helpful. Um, fungal infections, um, and here we're really sort of mostly talking about the endemic fungal infections in either immunocompetent patients or mildly immunocompromised patients. Um, and these often do appear as pulmonary nodules. Of course, most of the time, if you have an active fungal infection, you're going to have multiple pulmonary nodules. However, you may occasionally, like in this particular case, have an, a single nodule. Um, and uh, you may also see more commonly, you'll see um, a solitary nodule that represents a healed fungal pneumonia, and I'll show that in a second. Um, if the nodule is enlarging or if there's surrounding ground glass, those are good signs of active infection. But again, most of the time when we see this scenario, we're going to be looking at a healed fungal pneumonia. Um, so here is an example. This one happens to be active cryptococcal pneumonia in a patient with myeloma. Um, and here we happen to have the prior imaging showing the active pneumonia here in the right lower lobe. Um, and at one year, we can see that the pneumonia has healed, leaving this nodule, which is basically a granuloma. Um, this is a now a well-defined nodule. And if we did not have the prior, we would be left with an indeterminate nodule. Um, in this case, we do actually end up having proof that this is, was a histoplasma pneumonia. Um, and you know, from the same case, we actually have a PET scan done at the time of that follow-up. And the PET scan shows, FTG PET, in this case, shows some mild uptake in the uh, nodule itself and actually greater uptake in a hyalur lymph node. This is also a very common setting. Um, there's usually uh, reactive uh, lymphadenopathy in patients with fungal pneumonias. Um, and the FDG uptake will remain for a long time in these patients 
Um, so do not be dissuaded by that uh, necessarily. Although, of course, if you don't have a prior study, uh, then you're left with calling it, of course, indeterminate, um, or you may even be more worried based on the, the panopathy. But again, just be aware that um, FDG uptake in higher lymph nodes is not at all uncommon in uh, healed fungal pneumonia. Now, very rarely lung cancers can present as an oval nodule. And here we have one example of this. It was a slowly growing nodule. Um, you can see on the follow-up, there is some lobulation to the contour here, but otherwise it's pretty much a solid oval nodule. Um, and, uh, and this turned out to be an adenocarcinoma. So, but that's a very uncommon presentation of lung cancer. Moving on from oval nodules, I wanted to make a brief statement about cystic lesions, I'm calling it cystic nodule here, it's not really a nodule. Um, occasionally we'll see this sort of cystic region in the lung. Now in some patients with severe emphysema, they'll have this as part of their emphysema. Um, but you should always be a little bit wary when you see this <clears throat> kind of a lesion that is sort of separate from emphysema or in a patient without emphysema um, or kind of out of proportion to the amount of emphysema that they have. And you should also be particularly suspicious if there's some ground glass or focal wall thickening. Um, and these tend to be very, very indolent lung cancers. As you can see in this case, um, the patient was followed and five years later, we've developed a solid component as well as kind of increasing ground glass around this lesion. Um, this was resected and this turned out to be a mucinous adenocarcinoma. Um, the pathology does vary for these cases. They're almost always adenocarcinomas um, and uh, there's different sort of phenomenons that occur. Sometimes it's uh, cancer cells growing along the wall of the cyst. Sometimes it's cancer blocking off a small air space, airway, causing distal air trapping. Um, but anyway, in either case, if you see a focal cystic lesion like this, um, you should probably continue to follow it um, because a decent number of these do progress to lung cancer. Okay, so moving on from specific scenarios, um, let's say that, you're, that you do not have a specific benign feature um, how are you going to go about addressing the um, risk and kind of uh, management of an indeterminate nodule? Um, so remember a few things. Um, the cancer risk um, is greatest in part solid nodules. When I say that, I mean persistent part solid nodules. So if it's not an inflammatory nodule, but it persists over time, the cancer risk is greatest in part solid nodules followed by ground glass nodules and followed then by solid nodules. Again, remember that most solid nodules turn out to be intrapulmonary lymph nodes. Um, you may uh, use the morphology of the nodule itself. So we can see this nodule has a lobulated contour. So maybe some even a little bit of speculation here. Um, and obviously it's also a large nodule, right? Size, the larger the nodule, the more likely it is to be malignant. Um, and so you would certainly be very suspicious of this nodule, which turned out to be a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, absent those things, um, and if you have less experience or are just not sure where to put the nodule, um, you might use some risk calculators. Uh, the best known of these is the calculator developed by Brock University in Canada. Um, this nodule incorporates patient age, family history of lung cancer, um, patient sex, and uh, presence of emphysema as well as nodule characteristics, including location, size, um, density, if it's ground glass or solid, et cetera, speculation and the total number of nodules. Um, and it'll spit out a percentage of likelihood of malignancy. And so this can help you potentially triage nodules. Again, if you're, particularly if you're less experienced in looking at um, morphology of nodules. Um, for dealing with uh, subsolid nodules, in other words, ground glass and part solid nodules, um, you should report both the total nodule diameter as well as the size of any solid component. And the size of the solid component is really what the clinicians are going to use and what our guidelines suggest using um, to, determine the, uh, to determine the management of these nodules. So pure ground glass nodules can probably be just watched with surveillance CT, whereas nodules with, part solid, with solid components um, you're going to use the uh, threshold. So if you're using Fleischner, that cutoff is six millimeters or larger. If you're using lung rads, then eight millimeters or larger at baseline or four millimeters or larger if it's growing. Um, and those are going to be your thresholds to say this patient should probably see a surgeon for definitive therapy. 
Um, just remember that even though we said all this, large ground glass nodules can still be invasive adenocarcinomas. So if you see a large ground glass nodule, the patient may benefit from a surgical consultation to decide on their options, whether they have comorbidities, whether they're young, um, all of those may be factors in what the optimal treatment is for that patient. Um, and I want to leave you with a, a few last parting thoughts. Um, beware of uh, PET-CT for diagnosis of nodules. Benign entities can have FTG uptake. I showed you a fungal pneumonia earlier. This is a case of a pulmonary infarct here with FTG uptake. Um, and um, lung cancers can also have very low uptake. So particularly mucinous adenocarcinomas and ground glass and part solid nodules, um, all of those entities often have very little FTG uptake. You can see here a minimal, if any, FTG uptake in this um, sort of mixed attenuation lesion here in the right hilum really indistinguishable from the blood pool, um, but this was a mucinous adenocarcinoma. Um, I don't have a case here, but I, I want to just make you aware that in patients with severe emphysema, um, sometimes they can present with speculated looking nodules that are just inflammatory lesions. Um, and so in those cases, you know, obviously that patient is also at high risk of developing lung cancer. Um, and so in some cases it may be very helpful to do a short follow-up in one month or two months um, to look at how the lesion is evolving. And that's now in the new lung rads recommendations. Um, it's something really worth uh, thinking about. Pneumonias are not going to resolve in a month, but you may get a sense of the trajectory of the lesion, and that can be helpful in some cases. So I'll just present you with kind of a suggestion of an algorithm here. Um, if you see a nodule that you think is probably benign based on its morphology, let's say it looks like an intrapulmonary lymph node, um, depending on the patient risk factors and the nodule size, um, you may be able to just stop altogether, or you may um, recommend a follow up per Fleischner guidelines. If you have a nodule that's kind of in the intermediate range, that's large enough to really worry about, but maybe not quite large enough or suspicious enough for you to say, oh, this is a cancer for sure, um, you have a bunch of options um, and you may use the risk calculator um, to help kind of push you in one direction or another. Um, but as I alluded to, you may want to do a short interval follow-up. Um, the time of follow-up can be determined by the size of the nodule and other characteristics. Um, again, you know, you're looking for either an inflammatory process to resolve or maybe something that you're not so sure about. If it's stable, you can feel more comfortable. You may opt to use a PET-CT. Now remember that PET-CT has a lot of caveats, right? Inflammatory lesions are gonna be FDG avid. So the best use for the PET-CT is kind of more in the oval nodule category um, where it might help you triage, can we watch this lesion or do we have to intervene now? And finally, you may um, decide that it makes sense to pursue a biopsy of such nodule. If you see a nodule that you think is probably malignant, it's speculated or it's a persistent part solid nodule, um, that sort of thing, um, then I think you should go on to definitive therapy, have them see a specialist. Um, the need for biopsy in those cases will be just tailored based on patient preference and physician preference. Um, many of those patients will not really require a, a preoperative biopsy. Um, so just to end here, um, we covered what uh, counts as a pulmonary nodule or a solitary pulmonary nodule. We went over some examples of benign nodules, such as calcified nodules and intrapulmonary lymph nodes. Um, we described different nodule densities. We talked a little bit about the oval nodule. And then we ended up with a little bit about risk calculation and risk assessment for um, solid pulmonary nodules. So I hope you find this helpful. And uh, thank you.